Tonight on History So It Doesn't Repeat, we ask the question, is America safer now that we're openly being spied on? We'll discover how to check our premises and peer into the origins, form, and function of the intelligence community. By studying those who spy on us, we'll uncover the root causes of the war on terror, and you will have the facts to help end it. Learning's the answer. What's the question? It's all coming up next on History So It Doesn't Repeat. Welcome back to History So It Doesn't Repeat. I'm your host and navigator, Richard Grove, and tonight we're going to dig into some very interesting history that will help you understand the myriad stories focused on how our tax dollars are being invested into spying on American citizens. We're going to examine the primary assumption that intel programs spying on millions of Americans are justified to protect us from the so-called terrorists, and to do that, we're going to need to look into history. Joining me once again via Skype from sunny California is author Jan Irvin of Gnostic Media, and from Illinois, we have forensic historian Kevin Cole, who are both members of the Tragedy and Hope online research community. Together, we're going to perform an in-depth and informative service for everyone involved. And we're going to begin with checking our premises by asking the question, is the prevention of terrorism really the primary reason for these groups spying on the American public? Well, I don't think the I think the answer is quite complicated. After 9/11, we got the Patriot Act, which we know now uh, was a bunch of statutes and uh, authorizations that they had hoped to accomplish even before 9/11 happened. So you have to kind of question uh, how that came into being uh, when this terrorist attack just happened to happen at the time that it did. Now, the primary reason, yeah, they say it's to protect from terrorism, but you can also get struck by lightning before being a victim of a terrorist attack. What do you think, Jan? Do you think it's a primary reason? I mean, uh, they had the Patriot Act pre-written before 9-11, and uh, they were spying on American citizens and doing this sort of thing pre-9-11, but now after 9-11, in this post-9-11 world, it seems to be justified. Well, of course, they want us to think it's justified, but isn't that putting the cart before the horse? I mean, you don't commit the terrorism and then go out and then look for somebody who's doing it, right? Are you referring to the numerous times when our tax dollars have been funneled into so-called sting operations? I mean, according to the New York Times, 14 out of 22 post-9-11 so-called terrorist attacks were actually financed by U.S. taxpayer dollars and organized by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Sure, and there was an article that I found uh, the other day, um, and I'm just looking for it now. Modern art was a CIA weapon. There's a whole bunch of these types of things here. Uh, this uh, recent one, U.S. spy leaker goes ground on the uh, BBC. Um, you know, all of these different stories coming out where they're, you know, they they claim that they're using it for terrorism, but it's obvious that they're trying to uh, collect information on the American public. But I think it's more important first that we take a step back for a second and define the word terrorism. And, um, you know, and in fact, if in the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, I think it was, and I had it up on my website years ago, terrorism was something that was used by governments. It was government by coercion. Uh, yeah, government by coercion, exactly. But I think what would help us, beyond defining that word terrorism that has been so characteristic of 21st century life, let's go back in time to the early 20th century and look at the origins of this so-called intelligence community. I mean, if we assume that our tax dollars are being used to protect our rights, and we assume that these intelligence agencies are spying on us to keep us safe and secure and for our own good, then I think it's time to really check those premises to see if those assumptions are really true because we're at a critical time in American history. I totally agree with you and I think, you know, terrorism it used to be a tactic and what they've done is they've they've been successful through a clever public relations campaign on institutionalizing terrorism uh, as an entity whereas, you know, some people who maybe don't watch the news as much see it as, oh well that's a war on Islam. Uh people that are are directly involved in uh perpetu perpetuating this myth uh, also have a lot of money to be made because this constantly keeps the war machine going because terrorism as a tactic you, you can't stop that with a with a uh, a regular war so the, these are a lot of issues that I we I hope we are able to explore well the first thing I want to dig into is the origins of this intelligence community that that we know today I mean there's like 20 or 30 or more 
different intelligence agencies in the United States focused on both foreign and domestic surveillance. So there's a variety of these different organizations, but once upon a time, there were none, and then there were one, and I want to get into the people who you know, brought about these, uh, the fine things like the CIA, and you, before that you have to go to the OSS. And to get into that, I had to look into some of the books on the shelves of my library, books like The Old Boys by Burton Hirsch. That's one of my favorite books because it'll clearly show and demonstrate, uh, and then you can go out and verify it if you don't trust it. Uh, another one is Hugh Wilford's The Mighty Wurlitzer, uh, which is published by Harvard. It's a very respectable book. It's not conspiracy theory. This is simply understanding the, the people, places, things, money sources of these so-called intelligence agencies. And what you find are people like Alan Dulles and Frank Wisner, who are Wall Street lawyers, who are internationalists, who are people who are not so much patriots, but have allegiances to globalist, internationalist ideas where they want to dissolve boundaries of all countries around the world and then create a globalist society. And that means collectivism, that means individuals lose their rights. And that's why we as individuals care about these things and take the time to delve into history. So who wants to take the first comment on the origins of the intelligence community post Paris Peace Conference 1919? There's a few different layers here. Obviously, there's one layer to keep the conditioning in in place of, of what took place during World War I. And another layer is drugs and the opium trade because a lot of the covert operations are based on that. And then you're going to have another layer such as Miles Copeland who founded the OSS, whose son... Stuart Copeland was in the band Police, and Ian Copeland founded IRS Records and FBI talent, a talent Agency and these things. So then there's this other angle of it going off into the music industry and all of these sorts of things, which uh, Dave McGowan's research has exposed. So there's this multi-pronged sort of attack and angle around everything post-World War I and the different directions that they take intelligence. But, it, you know, all of it seems to be more directed at the general populace than, uh, than any one sort of quote-unquote terrorist group, if that's even a valid term, since it's a form of government. What do you think, Kev? Yeah, I, I concur with that. And I, I would also say that we probably need to go back even further than the Paris Peace Conference, because what you see happening after the death of Cecil John Rhodes uh, and really, you know, starting in the late 1800s with Carnegie's New Republic and his attempt to uh, get Great Britain to federalize, you, you, at this time, you started to see a transnational uh, cooperation take place uh, that was outside of the purview of national sovereignty. So starting with really the Pilgrim Society, where you have the business titans and the J.P. Morgan and uh, earlier interest on both sides of the uh, Atlantic, uh, leading up to uh, getting the United States into World War I in the first place and the uh, attempt to join the United States with the League of Nations. You find that the Dulles brothers were both involved in ecumenical movements with some of the key players of the Rhodes-Milner Roundtable Group, uh, such as Lord Lothian, uh, as well as Lionel Curtis. And so there's a religious uh, aspect of this as well in an attempt to create a universal church uh, and to create a unified society and the OSS, when you look in the founding of the OSS and the CIA, uh, there was a British Office of Intelligence at Rockefeller Center where Stevenson, who was the tutor to Wild Bill Donovan, uh, shared the office with him. So you, you have a lot of cooperation between British and United States intelligence going back uh, even further. Uh, you know, same with C.D. Jackson and his counterpart uh, and their relationship to the international relations uh, cadre called the uh, British uh, Office for the Theory of International Politics. And this is really uh, these transnational relationships, uh, which are so important to people that want to usurp national sovereignty, are, are really the genesis of the intelligence uh, operations. And in convincing the United States to have a uh, more friendly Atlantic, uh, Atlantic block-based relationship with Great Britain. I think you just summarized the entire episode right there. Okay, but I'm going to rewind and we're going to add one more person to uh, that uh, egregious rant of yours. The person I'd like to add is Clark Clifford, who's also a Wall Street lawyer, who created the National Security Act in 1947, which was a prerequisite for the CIA. Uh, he later was involved in the Bank of Commerce and Credit International, BCCI scandal, 
in the 1980s, a big money laundering, drug money laundering scandal under the guise of national security. So when we, re when we rewind and look at the agenda of the founders of this intelligence community in America, at least, uh, it's an Anglo-American establishment. It's taking cues from Britain. Their agenda is social control, monopoly of uh, monopoly for cartel, and to insulate against competition. So when we see those James Bond movies now, having looked at history, we see that, that the MI6 basically works for an invisible banking class, not really represented in the films directly. And their competitors are who James Bond goes out and kills, and he's like an MK Ultra slave. So now that you have that angle on Ian Fleming, who was involved in MI6, and there's a whole bunch of different angles. He also wrote a very interesting book on diamond smuggling that you might want to check out if you're into Cecil Rhodes and De Beers and following this chain of history. So Cecil Rhodes, and you mentioned Carnegie, uh, the New Republic book. I believe that was printed in 1893, and it's one of these books where, yes, he's making all this money in America. He's fleecing America. He's controlling America, treating his, his workers like slaves, taking these cues from Rockefeller, working together. And he writes this book and says, hey, you know what? America's time has passed. It's obsolete. The new thing is internationalism. And so he's basically professing his faith and laying out this document, which was printed before the death of Cecil Rhodes and before the creation of the Pilgrim Society and creation of the Roundtable Groups and CFR and all these other things that are legitimate political history in America that should be taught in every school and every adult should be literate in these types of ideas. So while Bill Donovan and C.D. Jackson, you also mentioned, C.D. Jackson, uh, we'll talk about this later maybe, uh, but he was involved in, in the origins of the Bilderberg Group, and there's some Nazi financiers and agendas involved with that. So, uh, you know, there's psychological warfare. When you think C.D. Jackson first, before you think publisher of these big magazines, think about the fact that his specialty is psychological warfare, and who's he surround himself with? Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who was also in psychological warfare during World War II, uh, Eisenhower, Nixon, these other caricatures of, of human beings that we've been, you know, portrayed as our leaders. But now that we grow up to be adults, you find out these people, uh, they're not only human beings with real errors, they're compromised and not really doing the things that we thought they were doing on their own. So jumping back into it, Jan, uh, this idea of spying and deception and counterintelligence that the intelligence community brings into our world, into our notice. It's advertised through movies. Now you can read about it every day in the newspaper with everyone being spied on these days so openly. Uh, what are your comments on how these types of organizations use, uh, call it dark shamanism, call it psychological warfare, call it black magic, uh, the black arts? How is this use of deception useful to them? And what do they gain from it? <laughs> well, it's probably just as much a double-edged sword for them because it's all done on irrationality and ignorance and these things tend to fall back on them when they're revealed rather than being upright and <laughs> forthright about things. So when this type of dishonesty is always used, there's always an air of just total irrationality and underlying stupidity. Now, that being said, <laughs> they're very clever with their lies and their tactics and their techniques. And um, it plays in on, you know, on so many different levels of the social control, be it LSD and entheogenic drugs or using logical fallacies to control people or you know providing uh, false information in the mainstream media, et cetera. These are all forms of mind control that come together. You know, you, you can't really see it if you just look at one thing. You know, you, you'll probably miss it if you just, you know, but if you see compulsory education, if you see the mainstream media and all of the disinformation, if you see the logical fallacies and logic not being taught and the trivium method, et cetera, and you see all of these different things laid out, then we can bring together a coherent picture on why and how it's used and you know, and where it's directed at. And sure, maybe to some extent they do operations overseas so that they can create wars and false flag operations and things like that because a lot of the way the military-industrial complex works is through <clears throat> creating these covert operations and then PRing them or using false information on the other side to keep them going, etc. Now... This guy, Clark Clifford, he was tied in with uh, Mary Pinchot Mayer, who was killed, 
the Iran hostage crisis, the Vietnam War, which is, you know, interesting because, you know, as, as you know, going back to what I was just saying, 60,000 boys killed in the Vietnam War here. Interestingly, the National Security Act, every time I file a FOIA request to get information back or go all the way to an appeal, they'll cite that all of this and what they're doing is legal under the National Security Act of 1947 that was written by Clark Clifford. So, it, you know, it makes a nice little tidy circle there. What do you think, Kev? Well, yeah, and Clark Clifford, of course, later becomes the Secretary of Defense after being a uh, real famous lawyer. Uh, he gets caught up in the BCCI scandal with the uh, money laundering. And as we know, if you follow, you follow the trail of the BCCI scandal, you find out that they were not only involved in funding uh, weapons and money and funneling this through the uh, Iran-Contra affair, but they also were involved in the funding of the Afghan Mahajadeen uh, that was fighting uh, Soviet Union at, on a proxy war on behalf of the United States. And then you, as a result of that, you get heroin and uh, a uh, importing of heroin in the United States and Europe, and that whole market goes up. Can you, do you have any information on the opium wars? Because what I'm sensing is this isn't really an American problem. America is now reflecting this Anglified view that's been brought in the 20th century. So I'm going to start digging into British intelligence and their history. And uh, so I want to start with one of the major financing roles of opium uh, throughout the world has been in not only the United States currently, but way back in times of yonder, back in the 1800s, 1700s, the British Empire had a, a, a thriving opium trade that they was using to suppress a, a certain group of people. What's the history on that really quickly before I move on with this, uh, this next point? Well, are you referring to uh, certain families within the United States that were involved in opium smuggling and trading or... Well, okay, so let's go with the Russell Trust and the Skull and Bones and work back to the British East India Company. Well, while we're with BCCI, it's interesting to note that John Kerry was uh, put in charge of the committee, uh, congressional committee, investigating the BCCI scandal. Uh, and that's kind of ironic when you find out that he is a member of the same Skull and Bones secret society as one of the families being investigated, which, of course, we know as the, the family of George Bush. George Herbert Walker Bush and his son and Prescott were all members of this secret society, Skull and Bones. Now, historically, if you look into that, you find uh, quite credible information that the Russell family had been involved in opium smuggling going back into the 1800s. William Huntington Russell founded Skull and Bones. He also created the uh, Pony Express, interestingly. And you're right on the 322 Skull and Bones. Now, if we go back a step there to the opium trafficking, what we find out there is that, uh, you know, and I tried to verify this reference with Rich a while back, uh, we may still need some uh, uh, grammar on this uh, particular subject, but maybe, Kevin, you have it. But uh, it appears that Sir Thomas Henry Huxley, who is Aldous and Sir Julian Huxley's grandfather and and Charles Darwin's propagandist, he was involved in the uh, opium trafficking of the 1800. And then you know, with, and that is with opium. Now you go forward, you skip a generation, and then Aldous is at the Esalen Institute promoting the same thing essentially as his grandfather, but rather than using opium, they're using psychedelics and positive thinking and the new age spirituality. So it's the same thing, just modified. It's like they released a new version of the program there. And uh, so then that, you know, the uh, it goes from Thomas Henry Huxley over to Julian Huxley on the other side, his other grandson. And uh, so Julian Huxley was behind UNESCO and he was behind the British Eugenic Society and a number of these other organizations. So then, you know, here we have this nice little tie in to the uh, eugenics programs, et cetera. Now, this is only one angle, but has anybody else done any more to flesh out that uh, Thomas Huxley uh, association to the opium wars? I have not yet, but I pick up the pattern that's being laid down that these internationalists control black markets, they're into eugenics. There's overlapping patterns from these different lines of study that we've all looked into social control, cybernetics, eugenics, GMOs, all, you know, financing, central bankers, all these different layers. It's a finite planet. There are certain groups of people that have certain overlapping interests, call them collectivists, and they've basically been 
infesting our intelligence agencies for the past century, changing the values, beliefs, actions of Americans through these types of programs. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask this question, if you guys are all right with me moving on, I wanted to ask this question uh, about... I think Kevin's got something for you there. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up where I left off. Uh, it was uh, William Huntington Russell's relative, Samuel Russell, who was in charge of one of the largest trading houses in China during the same period of time as the Opium Wars involved with the dynasty versus the British Empire. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Excellent. I didn't have that, that little link just, there, so that makes a nice, tidy little circle right there. Now, tying this circle in a knot, I want to introduce this character. You guys might, may or may not be you know, aware of this character. His name is Harold Kim Philby. He's named Kim after a Rutger Kipling book that his parents liked. And uh, I'm sure Jan knows the Freemasonic secret society history of Kipling and how it plays in it, as does Kevin into Cecil Rhodes. Hanging thing. out with Cecil Rhodes so and whatnot. There's a, that's an underlying theme, but let's stick to the, the facts. Harold Kim Philby was an MI6 agent. He was, he was part of British intelligence, who was also a double agent for Soviet Union's NKVD. So this guy was, you know, you know, intimately involved in Britain's secrets. And at the same time, he's working for the communists. And that sounds kind of out there until you discover the history where communism was being funded by the same people that fund uh, the Western world. And that the Western technology is being used to, you know, prop up the communism and the Cold War. So there's all this history, call it Anthony Sutton or Charlotte Iserby or John Taylor Gatto or any of these characters out there who have looked into this history. But the idea is there that there was this guy, a double agent named Kim Philby, part of the Cambridge Five, which was a, a group of communist spies that had infected the Anglo-American intelligence establishment. And they're very much connected, America and, and Britain. So can either of you tell me anything about Harold Kim Philby? Well, what I can tell you is that, uh, yeah, you mentioned he was a British intelligence officer, double agent for the Soviet Union, as well as the KGB. Uh, it, what, what's, what's so fascinating that you bring this up is that I, I'm looking at some uh, other research I'm doing on, on Carol Quigley and, and some of the uh, accusations he had against the so-called right and how they use some of his material for economic gain. And he kind of gets himself in a knot historically, and he may have uh, lived to uh, refute some of his own writings. Because what, what, what I found out was that the Cambridge Five included uh, suspected fifth men, uh, Victor Rothschild, and a guy by the name of Michael Whitney Strait. Now, Michael Whitney Strait's parents were Willard Strait and Dorothy Whitney, and they were the ones who bought the New Republic. And if you look on pages 949 and 950 through 953 in that area, you'll find in Tragedy and Hope that Carol Quigley kind of uh, chides the right for saying that the, uh, the left groups at that time were supporting the communist, and that wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, but then he's, he's proven wrong by history because you find out that Michael Whitney Strait uh, was also one of these members who was a double agent working to promote communism as a member of the Cambridge Five. And then his uh, father, Willard Strait, who was a J.P. Morgan man, also worked for American International Corporation, uh, bought the New Republic. So uh, I would urge people to look into that, and I uh, just find that extremely fascinating. We can also talk about Kim Philby's father, uh, who was an intelligence officer in his own right, involved with Saudi Arabia, MI6. He personally worked with uh, Alan Dulles, uh, favoring Nazi Germany. And uh, there is some, some speculation or some evidence that, that he was uh, working to stop a Jewish state. But we can go into that. We can talk about Kim's dad in a minute, because that's kind of the crescendo to this whole episode, what that all means and comes together. But let's jump into what you're talking about. You're talking about this Whitney character, and I couldn't help but thinking, you know, the, the, you know I, I'm observing what you're saying, I'm listening intently, I'm comparing it to what my experience is. And the experience is, the other co-founder of Skull and Bones, besides the Russell family, was the Whitney family, uh, such as the Whitney Museum in New York City. Uh, these are collectors of someone like Mark Lombardi's work, Mark Lombardi died a very similar death to that of Michael Hastings or Gary Webb or any of these other people. You should check out Mark Lombardi's Global Networks book. You can learn a lot about it. You can learn about the Bush-Saudi connection through James R. Bath just by looking at the cover of the book. BCCI is on there too. There's a lot of history that you should check out. Uh, so this, uh, the, uh, the other thing you mentioned was AIG. Uh, I couldn't help but noticing one of the founders of the OSS and co-founders of the CIA, Frank Wisner, his son, Frank Wisner Jr., was on the board of directors of Kroll Associates, AIG, and Marsha McLennan. 
And recently, recent news, he was over in Egypt when they were overthrowing the government, helping them restructure that stuff. So again, you should check into the sons, daughters, grandchildren of these Wall Street lawyers and bankers who founded the intelligence communities because it's not about protecting your rights or keeping you safe or any of this stuff. It's about them defending their monopoly against your hardworking competition. So, uh, Jan, did you have anything to say on Kim Philby before we roll ahead to uh, military coups and assassinations? I wanted to add there regarding the left and communism that uh, certainly the left in many respects has been co-opted. Now, I don't mean as in the term liberal ever befitting the free, which has also been co-opted. You know, the, the left and the word liberal have been spun to actually sort of uh, imply this communist uh, thing, which in fact is the antithesis of the meaning of the word. But so... Kevin mentions J.P. Morgan, of course, at J.P. Morgan was Gordon Wasson, who is the vice president of propaganda there. <clears throat> he was in charge of the CIA's MKUltra subproject 58. J.P. Morgan was a subcontractor for that, and we've already published all of the documents on that in recent shows, such as with Dr. Colin Ross. And uh, Wasson was also at the Century Club with Alan Dulles. Now, in my recent article that I wrote with Joe Atwill, uh, this w was, of course, one of the main themes. Aside from uh, communism, they're driving everybody back to essentially a neo-feudalism or a new dark age. But, you know, here's Wasson working with Alan Dulles there at the Century Club. Wasson's in charge of uh, MKUltra Subproject 58. And then, you know, there are very many ties and relations with Oh, the left and especially the hippie movement with socialist and, and communist ideologies uh, where people are basically pushed as adolescents way into their adulthood rather than taking control of their lives and their health and everything else and learning to be adults. They act as, as children and want the government to basically take care of everything and, and do everything for them. So I think that this is a, you know, all directly tied in right there. Well, I think it is tied in because you're talking about uh, J.P. Morgan funding the Soviet Union. Uh, the Standard Oil was also funding Soviets. They were also funding the Nazis. There's a whole bunch of overlaps in what would be national agendas because these people who are doing this financing and uh, lawyering, they're internationalists. And so you also have ties into the, uh, the MK Ultra culture through J.P. Morgan uh, and his interests and that company's interests. And the Rockefeller Foundation is deeply tied to MK Ultra. Kevin, right, that's right. Are either of you aware of Rockefeller Connections funding financing uh, MK Ultra? Well, actually, the yeah, the the Rockefeller Foundation uh, was involved in uh, funding MK Ultra through the Allen Memorial Institute, I believe, uh, which was in Canada. Is that that's correct? That's where you and Cameron worked, right? Right. And you and Cameron, of course, went on to be the head of the American uh, Psychiatric Association. He was uh, involved directly in the uh, laboratory uh, experiments and, and trials that stemmed out of uh, Alan Dulles's uh, office at the Central Intelligence Agency. Yeah, you're, I would agree with that, and I just found uh, my other citations here. They're also involved in hemp prohibition, which is interesting. John Foster Dulles was there. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, you know, and and uh, Rand Corporation is there. Now, didn't they come up with the term conspiracy theorist to keep people from uh, investigating matters? I think that's accurate. I know the first reference I've seen is from a 1968 FOIA request. It's a CIA document, and they're saying basically, how do we deal with Ed Epstein's book on the Warren Commission? And they're saying they have a protocol. It says, don't even worry about what it says, you know, deny... Uh, and, and basically use this term, and it says, quote-unquote, conspiracy theorists as a, de a derogatory term without even addressing the content, just ma basically make fun of them, and then they gave a bunch of examples. It's a fascinating document. I think it's uh, CIA document 1035. If you do a little Google search, you can probably find it. I think, that's, I think that was the number of it. But it's a fascinating piece of history because you can see the origins of this word, and then it doesn't really pop into the American public vernacular until I believe 1996 it shows up in the Oxford English Dictionary and that's where you see it because of the movie Conspiracy Theory by Mel Gibson uh, or with Mel Gibson uh, it was released at that time. So getting back to this idea of intelligence agencies and social control, we've talked a little bit about MKUltra, but now let's talk about 
how they assist military uh, you know, coups and actions, covert operations around the world, how sometimes uh, they're carrying out assassinations of leaders in other countries. I know that Kevin and I have recently seen a clip, I don't have the freedom to show you here, but it's Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, and basically what he's relating is that under the Pentagon's plans for information warfare, assassination is covered under that. They can assassinate people under the Department of Information Warfare in the Pentagon. I, I don't know how much we can talk about ex uh, exactly with that, but uh, for anybody un uh, unfamiliar with Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, a little bit of background on him. Uh, he was involved in the Defense Intelligence Agency's uh, Operation Able Danger project, in which he claims in his book Operation Dark, Dark Heart, which was heavily redacted by the Pentagon, well, what, what, he's, what he found in, in Operation Able Danger and what he claimed in his book was that key suspects uh, in the 9-11 terrorist attack and the official story of this event uh, were placed on, on a list where they were untouchable. They had uh, yellow post-it notes put over their face, and he wasn't allowed to further investigate them in any way. So you're coming from an area of, uh, of credibility with these types of tactics and these types of uh, intelligence operations. And what he did say was that uh, the uh, the role of assassinations can be seen along a information warfare strategy. When when he talks about uh, information warfare, including strategies, the immediate thing it makes me think of is somebody like Benazir Bhutto, who had came back to uh, Pakistan and threatened to uh, 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 run against Musharraf in the next election, where she had a huge amount of publicity. And uh, it's something like her assassination could have been included uh, in an information warfare strategy. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what happened, but I have seen quite a bit of evidence to suspect uh, that is a possibility. So uh, it, you're not talking about people that view the death of one individual with any kind of uh, uh, empathetic concern. You're talking about somebody or the type of person that views human beings as targets uh, in order to affect changes in their own uh, information strategy. Well, I remember journalists like Gary Webb who were digging into the CIA, Iran-Contra, cocaine, all, all those different uh, kind of scandals that were going on there. And he didn't end up very well for, for doing his stories. Although, I think the LA Times just recently published an apology saying, hey, Gary, Reb Gary Webb was onto something, but too bad that we all let him get killed years ago and did nothing about it as far as journalists, right? So that, that's well, they actually put 17 journalists on to attack and debunk tiny little things instead of looking at the larger picture. No, that's and I, I don't think right. it was the LA Times that, was, that apologized. I think it was the writer. Uh, yeah, one of the writers, Katz, who right. came out and apologized for his actions, uh, which led to uh, Webb's murder or suicide. Well, the thing I'm really concerned about is that 300 plus million people in America pay tax dollars and like if you cut our military and intelligence budget by 80%, it would still be larger than any other country on the planet. So why are we so insecure as a country is one question, but what I'm observing is all this money is being poured into private contractors, defense contractors, Pentagon military budgets for intelligence, all these different things to watch us, the citizens, right? Um, but if these people are also running drugs, and they're seeking to monopolize and insulate against competition, isn't there just a chance that they might use some of those things that we paid for for national defense to actually defend their, their heroin routes and drug smuggling and these sort of things? Is there any sort of history to that beyond this conspiracy theorist journalist called Gary Webb? Something called Iran-Contra. Oh, right, 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 right. And I think the church committees also probably brought some of this stuff up. Yeah, MK Ultra. Yeah, that's right. 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 Rockefeller Commission. I'll have to make a note. Yeah. Of that. So yeah, we don't. You know, they don't acknowledge those things actually happened. I mean, you know, Iran Contra. That that didn't get any national attention. You know, and what's interesting is uh, several years ago I inter interviewed John Loftus on my show, and uh, on my show he. You know, and he was one of these top guys under the Carter and Reagan administration, and he denied that the stuff, anything really goes on is part and parcel for their, you know, their just their standard protocol, their modus operandi. So it, uh, you know, it, that was when I started questioning some of his background, other than he always leads people astray from studying certain aspects that would lead people to question the official storyline and his official storyline as well. 
Well, you mentioned Jimmy Carter, and I you know, recall that Jimmy Carter got his job. According to Barry Goldwater in his book, his memoir is called With No Apologies, Chapter 33, no, it's chapter 34, it's the one after the, it's the one after our non-elected rulers. And basically tells a story how uh, Brzezinski and Rockefeller got together. They, they thought Carter would be a good guy. They go recruit him. Uh, they do some Wall Street bank deals to help get this all solidified, to fund him, to make sure he gets to be president. And so uh, Carter's uh, initiation into the Trilateral Commission is simply, you know, a ploy to get him on the ticket so people know that he's a made guy and he can go do these sort of things. So uh, Carter's national security advisor was this guy Brzezinski, who we're going to come to in a couple minutes. But I want to talk about this thing called the National Security Advisor or the National Security Council. The people who kind of direct these intelligence agencies on their covert ops, their drone strikes on people and, and all this sort of stuff. Who are, I was curious, you know, who, who are these people on the National Security Council? Now, how do they get their jobs? Are these people that we elect? I mean, obviously they're in control of influencing the direction of all these tax dollars that, that we just throw over the wall to the IRS. So has anyone looked into, have either of you looked into the National Security Council? Sure. The National Security Council was founded in 1947 uh, by Harry Truman. And the goal of this uh, at face value is the coordination and control of the armed forces, the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, and any other operations they have. And they thought uh, back then, much like you know the Homeland Security Department now after 9-11 was supposed to, oh, re-coordinate everybody together because the 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 intelligence failures that led to 9-11. You know, they used this uh, idea of intelligence failures as the way that 9-11 happened when we know that George W. Bush had the August presidential PDB in his hand a month before that outlined quite a bit of this plot. Um, now, the back to the National Security Council, uh, yes, this is, this is a plan uh, put forth by Truman as a way to, at the time, uh, kind of make up for intelligence failures uh, during the war. And uh, the, you see that Truman, of course, is responsible for putting forth the, the Marshall Plan uh, later on, uh, furthering the Marshall Plan. And when you look at uh, individuals who are close to the president who are advising him on this, uh, you'll find that Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, who was also a Rhodes Scholar, had also been in the position of, of national security advisor. So it, it's a group of individuals that are pre-selected, usually from foreign policy think tanks, also from industry. Uh, you'll find some from uh, oil and business uh, that, that are in there from time to time. But each, each administration gets to pick their own national security advisors. And I believe there is some permanence uh, you know, in continuity, just like we saw today with uh, FBI Director uh, Robert Mueller stepping down and uh, Obama putting in James Comey. And James Comey was, of course, the uh, Republican uh, appointee of George W. Bush. So there's a lot of continuity. You'll find you know, Henry Kissinger, uh, Dick Clark, uh, you know, a, a lot of these individuals who are, who are involved uh, in the uh, apology for 9-11 and the intelligence failures are, are some of the same people that surround the president and are supposed to coordinate these national security objectives. Well, what you're noticing is a continuity of influence. Uh, I was looking at my brain model over here. I also see someone named Philip D. Zelikow as part of the National Security Council at one time. Now, does the National Security Council have, uh, does it have obligatory rights? Uh, does it have authority over the Joint Chiefs of Staff? I'm not sure if it has uh, direct uh, temporal authority over them, but I know uh, it is responsible for advising directly the president who is then making decisions based on this panel of advisors. So I, I'm not familiar if they have uh, you know, authority outside of the president's chain of command. There are probably uh, authorities that are delegated to them that they act upon quite regularly. And I also notice there's a lot of famous historical events that go on in 1947. Uh, there, there's Roswell, whatever that was. There's a National Security Act. There's a creation of the CIA. I believe, wasn't uh, Israel created in 1947 or was that 1948? I don't want to digress into the history of other countries. We're sticking to our own intelligence tonight. Uh, we'll have to do a whole other show on the Anglo-American Israel connections to intelligence. And we'll include Amdocs and all those good companies, but it would take more preparation. I'm just trying to stick to the Anglo-American establishment tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, take a note here that the, the policies of the National Security Council of the CIA can be best reflected as admit nothing, deny everything, and make counter accusations. And that's what the term conspiracy theorist is. It's not addressing any facts or references or evidence. It's saying, hey, whatever you said goes right past me. Conspiracy theorist. It's a retort. 
It's an example to make a counter accusation that you don't know what you're talking about, that you haven't done your homework. And that's what Alan Dulles is most famous for saying, although it's hard to find a written reference of it. It's a, it's a brilliant saying that he said, well, you know, when people said about the Warren Commission and aren't you concerned that they're going to find contradictions. First off, the Warren Commission and 9-11 report, there's nothing in there that wasn't brought uh, out as consensus. It's agreed upon truths, and if it didn't have unanimous consensus, it doesn't make it into that report. And truth is not consensus-based, it's objective. So that's why those reports are no good. But he said, uh, the American people don't read. That's why no one's going to figure this out, that the internationalists had actually pulled a coup and wiped out the President of the United States in front of everybody on TV. I mean, you have a, a nice guy like Walter Cronkite, and he's taking off his glasses, and he's like telling you, he's an internationalist. He's one of the globalists. He's a federal, a world federalist. Uh, you know, there's a famous speech with him and Hillary Clinton uh, at this world federalist conference, and he says a comment to the effect of he was being accused of being part of the new world order of globalists who want to, you know, dissolve nations and, and internationalize everything. And uh, he he has this quote. I don't even want to repeat it, but maybe I can cut to it without copyright infringement on YouTube. We'll, we'll see how it works out in post production. He wrote. And literally, any attempt to achieve world order before that time must be the work of the devil. Well, join me. I, I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. <laughs> Let us hear the peal of a new international liberty bell that calls us all to the creation of a system of enforceable world law in which the universal desire for peace can place its hope and its prayers. But the idea is that what we're being exposed to with real history is counter to what we were taught. These ideas that we're taught in America about how things work, uh, the, the checks and balances, and all this power and money, all this stuff that you're giving as individuals that make this big thing called America, it's all being used to our best benefit, and it's really helping people around the world. And we're trying to spread liberty and crack down on tyranny while we have gulags in this country and people being renditioned and people being assassinated and drones being authorized in this country. There's a lot of things going on in this country that are kind of just getting on the edge of some bad dystopian fiction that I would like to stay away from if we could all just use a method of thinking critically. And that's in our other episodes. But this episode is really about who are these people. And now I think we're beginning to see, we're getting to paint a picture that these are the people who think that they're above the law so if you compare that to the actions of the 21st century here, uh, Patriot Act, CISPA, NSA spying on everybody, all these different things, these didn't come out of nowhere, these situations. They have a, a root, a basis in history. These people have a purpose, an agenda. And we're trying to flesh out what that agenda is without scaring you too much with it all at once because uh, it is vastly different than that which our nightly news programmers on CBS and NBC and ABC have told our families and, and ourselves over the past decades. I think that's a great point we did make with the uh, the alleged quote from Alan Dulles, uh, whether or not there's confirmation of that or not. I think that really rings true. And, and the way that they are able to operate with impunity uh, is that nobody's having the same conversation that they are. Uh, as long as people are looking over here or constantly distracted by uh, the the media or the uh, what I would call the unity box that is trying to sell people on the same ideas and the same way of looking at uh, all topics. It's just that people aren't reading the same information and therefore aren't having the conversation. Uh, you know, since the early 1900s, uh, there has been a separate national security state. Whether or not it's the national security advisors that advise the president, or it's these outside influences that were brought in by the president when they brought in J.P. Morgan, they brought in the people from the American International Corp to, uh, you know, put in the Federal Reserve through J.P. Morgan's uh, plans. Uh, so there's there's been for a long time a separate establishment that has developed in contradistinction to our idealized forms of how government works. And I think if the, the more that we're able to flesh these things out and, and show the historical design during our lifetimes, we can hope to leave a better place and a better map for those that come after. Let me just throw in there real quick regarding the Century Club, because the Century Club, you know, Alan Dulles, Gordon Wasson, Dwight Eisenhower, Aldous Huxley, and, you know, there's hundreds of other people, but this Century Club really seems to be a key center behind a lot of these operations. And it, uh, I think, in the 1800s was supposedly a center where they met to strategize and create uh, you know, military strategies. So 
if the, you know, did the was this military strategy? The question is always against the people, as the evidence about the Century Club and the CIA and these other, you know, the NSA, et cetera, these other organizations show. And another big issue is that we have all of these think tanks and think groups, et cetera, who advise the president and this or that council, et cetera. Well, it seems to me that without public oversight, these types of committees and think tanks, think tanks, et cetera, should be illegal because they should be elected people before they're allowed to advise a president or someone. I mean, there has to be public oversight there. I think that's a great point that you bring up with the Century Club. And I think what we can distill from it is this, is that the Century Club, like many of these other clubs uh, where they would get together and discuss foreign policy, was created to aid Great Britain. And why was it created to aid Great Britain? It's because Great Britain, uh, ever since Carnegie made his proclamations, uh, was being seen as uh, declining in stature around the world. They were losing power throughout the uh, Imperial Commonwealth. Uh, and so with the Century Club being created to, to aid Great Britain, this is the common thread that we find throughout Atlanticism or the uh, philosophies of the Council on Foreign Relations and the philosophies of the Atlantic Institute as well as the Council on Foreign Relations. And because so much of what is surrounding the Council on Foreign Relations activities has been put in such a cartoonish manner where it's been linked with groups where there is no linkage and there's never been a real discussion amongst those that are trying to make a change and speak against this to actually outline the philosophy that they put forth. And I think that's what we're doing here now. And it's really this Atlantic philosophy that Great Britain was an Atlantic power that was so powerful uh, and, and something that even Carol Quigley in Tragedy and Hope said uh, was his sole disagreement aside from the secrecy that the group put forward is that he really saw them as a European power and they were trying to claim Atlantic status where it would be this union of democracies and there would be an enhanced cooperation. What Carol Quigley uh, put forth and said as the balance of power strategy. And if you look into Ludwig de Hio's work on the precarious balance, uh, this really lays out what we're talking about. And then you start to see that the Bilderberg Group, which uh, Richard mentioned earlier, which was uh, founded in relation uh, to C.D. Jackson, bringing them to the United States and other institutes that were uh, involved on both sides of the Atlantic uh, to, to get the United States involved on a permanent basis. They had their first meeting and they weren't sure if they were going to continue yearly, but thanks to the help of C.D. Jackson and others, they went ahead and, and went through with that. And so the Bilderberg Conference uh, can really be seen as a continuation of the Union Now strategy and the Union of Democracy strategy, except on the global business level. Well, and Union Now is a, you know, Clarence Street was a Rhodes Scholar, as was Stringfellow Barr, who wrote, uh, I forget the title of his book, but it's an internationalist book. It's the same type of philosophy. And one of the keys of this Atlanticism is that the, the people bringing this to America are not about individual rights or any of this sort of stuff that we call American, the American way. It's about collectivism. They're partnered with communism. Quigley says very clearly that these people, that even though they're capitalists, they fund and work with very closely the communists because they value the collectivist rights for their livestock, not for themselves. They want to be gods. They act like they're god and have rights over you and, and eugenics and Rockefellers and remodeling that as uh, molecular biology. I mean, we can get, have a whole episode on that. They are on all fronts trying to harness our human resources to take our attention, to make us waste our lives in servitude to them. And I'm just saying that if they're going to do that, they're going to have to work a little bit harder because we are getting smarter. Um, this other idea of the Cold War being uh, psychological warfare in reality. Uh, people like C.D. Jackson helped to construct that. The CIA helps to propagate that as long as it could go. And then they shift gears into the, the war on terrorism, which is where we're going with all this uh, questioning into Kim Philby. Because it was Kim Philby's father, uh, a guy named St. John, or as the British would say, Sinjin Philby, and he was uh, one of the people who was instrumental in creating the Saudi royal family, uh, getting the British and American oil contract and setting up Saudi Arabia as it is today, uh, starting out the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the Anglo-American proxy for terror that can be conveniently used uh, as plausible denial under the realm of, under the rubric of national security. And so all these things start to tie together. 
Uh, but, but before we do that, I had mentioned uh, the Rhodes Scholarships and the Union Now Project, which is an Atlanticism project. Let's go into the, the foundations and books like, uh, you know, Imperial Brain Trust or Universities and Empire or Compromise let Campus. Me, let me just say something, Rich, before we go there, if I may. Uh, because, uh, you know, I was just looking at some of these other connections that I have here regarding the Bilderberg Group. Uh, C.D. Jackson, of course, last year uh, I noted in my article on Gordon Wasson that uh, there were some associations there with C.D. Jackson. Of course, uh, Wasson and uh, Eisenhower were both at the uh, Century Club together. Eisenhower was also a part of the Bilderberg Group there. And then if we cut over to, um, let's see here. Let me just go one one more step here. Uh, David Rockefeller. Now, David Rockefeller, he was also a member of the Fabian Society, where Aldous Huxley was a member. Now, we mentioned him earlier and his selling of these things. And uh, he was also a member of the London School of Economics, where Gordon Wasson went to school. Okay, so again, we have an immediate tie back into this little circle here. And the London School of Economics is one of the Rothschild banking empire financed institutions as is uh, magazines of our Congress, Roll Call and Congressional Quarterly, uh, The Economist. There's, there's a whole slew of international banker investments to help shape the attitudes, behavior, and uh, America, of Americans. Yeah, and the London School of Economics was, of course, funded by the Fabian Society. So that's, a, that's a terrific point. And we could go into, uh, for days, the history of the Fabian Society and uh, Thomas Davidson's role with the settlement movement in the United George States. George Bernard Shaw, this, you guys. Sure. 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 And, ha and how this really leads to a lot of the trans transatlantic uh, relationships that foster things like the Pilgrim Society and those that jumped on board with funding Cecil Rhodes' legacy. Uh, to your earlier question, I would start with this quote from Carol Quigley from Tragedy and Hope from page 950. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way that the radical right believes the Communists act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the roundtable groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the Communists or any other groups and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I've studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or most of its aims and have for much of my life been close to it in many of its instruments. I have, I have objected both in the past and recently to a few of its policies, notably to its belief that England was an Atlantic power rather than a European power and must be allied or even federated with the United States and must remain isolated from Europe. But in general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown, and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. That's Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, page 950. And what we're talking about here is the group that was propped up by Lord Milner and the other Rhodes trustees. Now, they didn't latch on to this as a permanent plan, but they saw it as their best opportunity at the time to bring the United States back under British dominion. They had already changed the name of the British Empire to the British Commonwealth. Uh, that's Lord Zimmerman and Lionel Curtis is doing. Uh, and this is, this is all talked about by Carol Quigley in his works. But they latched on to an American Rhodes Scholars plan by the name of Clarence Streit. And he developed what's called the Union Now Project, where it was supposed to be a union of democracies, uh, basically part of the three-power Atlantic bloc that Qu Carol Quigley describes in his works. And they even got, a, got, got this into Congress and had senators pushing it, but it didn't pass at the time. But they, they still exist till this day, and they are still very much involved in the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the Strait Council, which at the time had people like Stringfellow Barr, uh, and Scott Buchanan, who were involved in the Great Books of the Western World Project. And it was all a way of creating aid to Great Britain by trying to create a, a federal uh, uh, union of democracies based on Alexander Hamilton, uh, as, as read by F.S. Marvin, who was another member of the Rhodes Mil Milner inner circle. Now, these same individuals were really very much influenced by Alfred Zimmern's work, The Greek Commonwealth, which laid out the best ways for a nation to maintain its its polis and I talked about a lot of this within the uh, trivium uh, versus trivium method uh, classical education versus trivium method uh, conversation uh, back in March as well. Kevin you just sent me a quote the other day from Arnold J. Toynbee uh, that I published at tragedyandhope.com it was Arnold J. Toynbee he's a for those of you playing at home he's a famous British historian from a famous British family so you should respect him because he has a lot of authority 
And what he says is that he wanted uh, America and England to be merged, that uh, it was obscene, basically, that we have sovereignty in this country, that we are individuals, that we are not subject to somebody with uh, some sort of disorder where they think that everyone should serve them and that they could violate your rights and have special privileges. That's not cool. So uh, this, this historian, Toynbee, uh, is elaborating upon his opinions in a very eloquent way. Kevin, bring us the quote in a stylish manner that would befit this audience. Sure. That comes from the trend of international affairs since the war. Uh, international affairs, November 1931, uh, page 809. Uh, Arnold J. Toynbee uh, was brought into the Rhodes Milner Roundtable Secret Society, according to Carol Quigley, by Alfred Zimmerman. Now, Alfred Zimmerman and, and Carol Quigley got together in 1947, in which Toynbee told him that I came into this secret society because I was involved in the Educational Alliance. Now, the Educational Alliance is all tied, tied back to the settlement movement, where they were trying to move rich people into poor areas and poor people into rich areas. And you'll find that Arnold Toynbee's uncle, uh, had a settlement house named after him by Lord Milner himself. Now, what Arnold Joy Toynbee says in the Royal Institute of International Affairs article is that if we are frank with ourselves, we shall admit that we are engaged on a deliberate and sustained and concentrated effort to impose limitations upon the sovereignty and independence of the 50 or 60 local sovereign independent states, which at present partition the habitable surface of the earth and divide the political legions of mankind. It is just because we are really attacking the principle of local sovereignty that we keep on protesting our loyalty to it so loudly. The harder we press our attack upon the idol, the more pains we take to keep its priests and devotees in a fool's paradise, lapped in a false sense of security, which will inhibit them from taking up arms in their idol's defense. The local nation-state, invested with the attributes of sovereignty, is an abomination and desolation standing in the place where it ought not. It has stood in that place now, demanding and receiving human sacrifices from its poor deluded votaries for four or five centuries. Our political task in our generation is to cast this abomination out, to cleanse the temple and to restore the worship of the divinity to whom the temple rightfully belongs. In plain terms, we have to retransfer the prestige and prerogatives of sovereignty from the 50 or 60 fragments of contemporary society to the whole of contemporary society, from the local nation states by which sovereignty has been usurped with disastrous consequences for half a millennium to some institution embodying our society as a whole. In the world as it is today, this institution can hardly be a universal church. It is more likely to be something like a League of Nations. I will not prophesy. I will merely repeat that we are at present working discreetly with all our might to wrest this mysterious political force called sovereignty out of the clutches of the local nation states around the world. And all of the time we are denying with our lips what we are doing with our hands. Now, if you ever wanted context on the Rockefeller, the David Rockefeller memoirs, page 505 quote, where he says, hey, some people accuse me and my family of being internationalists, and he admits to it. Right there in his own memoirs, I have both a hardback and a paperback version because I wanted to make sure it wasn't a misprint, right? So, it, it, you know, it, it, the people that are doing this to us as Americans, the people who are spying on us, the people who are pillaging our economy, the people who are really putting us in danger in this country are not the Muslim Brotherhood funded uh, terrorists who, when you trace that funding back, it goes back to Anglo-American bankers. Uh, so it's not those, those people that they are being funded around the world to attack us. It's the people funding those people with our tax dollars and doing it in our name, carrying out all these covert actions. So between the Rockefeller family and all these other powerful families, J.P. Morgan interests, the Rothschild interests, at the end of the day, we're told that we're under attack by these terrorists. And yet when you look into, like, well, okay, so Osama bin Laden, bad guy. Let's get him. Where'd he come from? Oh, he was trained by Zbigniew Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor in 1979. And they broke laws to do that. But, you know, that's, that's how they do that. Uh, they, you know, they, they fund these guys and then they turn up and they're useful idiots or, or however it works. Uh, the bin Laden family's been deep in business with the Bush cartel since the 1970s, since the 1970s. And the, his, his money manager between the Bushes and the Bin Ladens was this guy, James R. Bath, who again, connects back to the Bank of Commerce and Credit International, Clark Clifford, money laundering, drug smuggling, arms dealing, uh, you know, and, and assassinations of innocent people. So if they were doing that on their own and we weren't funding them, that would be a problem. But since there's 300 million people in this country who have been purposely lied to, 
who have been subject to psychological warfare in their daily media, generation after generation, I thought we should spend some time fleshing this out because it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Well, I would say that uh, can't disagree with that. You know, it's it's certainly obvious that they're funding things like Al Qaeda and uh, all of these other groups, and then uh, turning around and years later, either if it's blowback and their own stupidity, or their own creation and nursing creation of them, and then nursing them along so that they can use them for these very purposes later on, or if they're not just entirely mythical in the first place. But yeah, you know, as you said, it's not uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and stuff like this. We have, besides the Anglo-American establishment, you know, there are so many ties into Zionism in these guys. I mean, Brzezinski, et cetera, all of these guys go into Zionism and this whole agenda. So aside from the Anglo one, which is real, there is also the Zionist agenda. And ironically, you know, Balfour and all of these guys, they work together on this. That is absolutely correct, that there is much more to learn on that topic. But I can reference uh, Quigley's 1947 book, although it wasn't published till after his death, if I recall, titled The Anglo-American Establishment, in which he faithfully describes what I've found in history through separate artifacts. So having already done my research, I then read this book, and in this book, it gives a, a pretty faithful recounting of what's available out there to be independently verified. And what he explains is the history of the Anglo-American establishment and the, uh, the so-called Zionist political elements that later created Israel. Uh, they are doing deals early in the 19th, uh, early in the 20th century, and even back into the 19th century. Um, there is a, a great deal of influence of Balfour, who, whose boss was Lord Rothschild, uh, and it's all described in the Anglo-American establishment by Carol Quigley. Um, I'm having trouble remembering the page numbers right now, but I'm sure that Kevin remembers the section that I'm talking about. It's the section where he goes into, he's like, here's, where the, here's why the British had a choice to work with either the Arabs or the Zionists, and here's the business reasons they chose the Zionists, and even though they, they thought the Arabs were cool and they liked to hang out in those countries and they found them affable, they found better business with the Zionist political interests than they could depend on through the Arab community. And that's why since St. John Philby, all the way up through Zbigniew Brzezinski and other characters that are doing the same thing today uh, on a ground level. Uh, I think uh, Sibel Edmonds had identified one of these uh, CIA guys who was involved with the Sarnayevs and uh, training uh, Muslim Brotherhood people, having them live in his house. Uh, but I, I can't, that guy's name slips my mind right now. Yeah, I can't think of his name either. Uh, oh, Graham Fuller. It, it says here that he specializes in Islamic extremism. Does that mean creating it, or what does that mean exactly, I wonder? Well, the, the Sarnayev uncle used to rent a house from Graham Fuller, from, from what the evidence looks like. So it just seems like, again, taxpayer dollars going to the government, going back to the intelligence agencies to set up patsies, whether it's Imad Salem, an Egyptian military officer who recorded the FBI agent John Antisev in 1993, telling the, you know, the FBI telling him how to make the bomb, use the real bomb. They knew they, he was their patsy. He recorded that. That's history. You should check that out. So what we're tracking here is for over 100 years, there seems to be this, this trickle of taxes up through a system back down into some sort of tyranny, that, you know, a gun that gets pointed back at individual citizens, not just in this country, but now that we have these drones flying all over the world, all over the place. I mean, this is like Skynet come alive. This is like a, a bad Hollywood movie that just won't end. We, we should point out that uh, this guy, Graham Fuller, was actually responsible for the creation of Iran-Contra, and he was CIA for 20 years. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to look for the head guy behind Iran-Contra and uh, the CIA drug trade, there it is, right there. Our so-called um, Islamic fundamentalist expert, who, of they course, creates they, and spends this stuff. They want you to think it's Oliver North. Oliver North was the bad guy. Or Reagan. Reagan, the, the, you know, the dumb actor who worked for the OSS and CIA since his career ever started. I mean, come on. You, that guy's not responsible for anything. If you think he was running this country, you got another thing coming. You should read some history. What do you think? He's got a cute little website, you guys. Graham E. Fuller, author. And it's got somebody like walking away down the road. It's like your typical propaganda website, website him there, smiling all pretty. Do you have that joint? Well, I think if we look at the 
Do you have that Joy Camp app so you yeah. can see if they're targeting you with the drone right now, Jan? I already know they are. I mean, you know, but, you know, Michelle Meeks at the CIA, the one who I file all the FOIA requests I'll let Kevin at. Respond. And, let Kevin respond. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's fine. I was I was just going to say, uh, yeah, with Graham Fuller, uh, whether or not he was in directly involved, here's the facts that we do know. Uh, you know, as soon as the Boston bombing took place, they went looking for the media did uh, looking for family members in which they could get on to get reactions from, and they go down to Maryland and they approach the Sarnayev uncle. Uh, and they don't mention anything, and he doesn't mention that he had been involved in uh, living with the uh, CIA off officer many years before. He had been married to Graham Fuller's daughter. Now, the ironic thing that I see, and you know, we'll have to look look into it more uh, for investigation, is that Graham Fuller was with the CIA for for 27 years, and then he goes on to the Rand Corporation, which is of course a contractor to the federal government as well as the Central Intelligence Agency. And his expertise on exp uh, Islamic extremism just happened to cover the area geographically in which the Sarnaya brother went back to and where there's all kinds of uh, fomenting of dissent uh, and, and fighting going on with Putin uh, at this time. So I, I find all of those connections to be highly ironic. I can't say that Graham Fuller knows anything more than he, than he said, but uh, I think the things that are, are talked about with the, uh, uh, the Turkish connections uh, with Sybil Edmonds and the uh, documentary that was done on her and the connections that she's been allowed to release as the uh, most gagged individual in the history of the United States are, are even more damning. We have Graham Fuller's 2008 book titled The New Turkish Republic, Turkey's Pitical, uh, Pivotal Role in the Middle East. And of course, over the last couple of weeks, we've had the large Turkish riots, etc. Hmm, I wonder if there could be a connection. Well, I mean, that's the thing. When you pay attention and you start to do some digging, there are connections. Whether or not it was foul play or something, you know, but there's always connections. There's always, you know, uh, an interesting story behind the names you're, you're hearing and the history that we're alluding to. And that's what we kind of want you to dig into. In the absence of having investigative journalists in this country, we all have to kind of take it upon ourselves to be really critical of the stories that we're hearing across the Internet and ask questions. For instance, the Boston bombing. There's a lot of contradictions. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. Most of them were spread by corporate cartel media outlets who don't verify anything because they don't have any investigative journalists. So it's kind of a circular loop. It's hard to tell the Psy War from real idiots. And I think that tells you about the irrationality of Psy War. They kind of have to make it look idiotic to get anything done. Um, the Boston bombing, one of the cases, uh, so uh, you have the case of one of the witnesses uh, in questioning, unarmed, uh, you know, who gets killed, who dies. That's kind of suspicious. There, you know, but there's another story where two FBI counterterrorism agents fell out of the helicopter during a training exercise. They were part of the elite hostage rescue team that responded to the Boston bombing. But everyone's saying that those guys were offed because they had something, you know, they saw something they weren't supposed to, this sort of thing. So I did some digging into it the first day I heard that being reported. And it turns out that unit has like 900 guys on that team that respond all over the country. So just because they responded to that area or to that event doesn't mean they had any direct contacts with either the Sarnayev suspect, or the, the brothers, or the evidence that's there, or any of it. So it's just hard because, well, it's not hard work. It's work we're not used to doing because we thought there were authorities protecting us and doing this hard work for us. But when you grow up, you find out, hey, there's not many adults around. And you've got to outgrow the adolescence that has taken you this long to realize and start asking questions, looking things up, using the resources, using the tools, and, and digging into all the other productions because what we're talking about in this episode is connected to basically every other piece of our work, and yet all those pieces of work are unique pieces, uh, uh, you know, components of knowledge that help you put together the puzzle. They're all puzzle pieces, uh, but all the edges do touch together, everything is connected, and there is coherence to it once you start using a method to identify what is substantial and dismiss the arbitrary. Uh, Jan or Kevin, any closing words for this episode? Because there's so much more to talk about. We'll have to do this in other sessions. But to wrap it up for this episode, you know, connecting the intelligence communities to the international bankers and the drug smuggling and the social control, spying, cybernetics, all that sort of stuff. Anything on anything you want to say on those topics? Well, these, these, these topics all have real world consequences. Uh, when you, when you track back the funding for, for BCCI, you do find that the Afghan Mahajadeen, who of course is a big new Brzezinski, uh, touts his involvement with in, in fomenting their, 
uh, angst against the Soviet Union. Uh, he tells them that God told you this is your land and you need to go after that. There are very real world consequences. Now, whether or not we are talking about blowback, as, as Jan mentioned, or, or insider knowledge, those are things that we can flesh out in, in future episodes. There is quite a bit of evidence that uh, they will go to those lengths. So I, I think this has all been a very relevant discussion, uh, and uh, I look forward to speaking on it more. You know, I agree with Kevin. These are all very pertinent topics, and people need to stop burying their heads in the sand regarding them and dismissing them with, you know, cliches like conspiracy theory and actually get down and follow the paper trail and the citations. And in fact, while I'm thinking about it, maybe it would behoove us to do an episode or few on how to do research so that people get the concepts of tracking down and verifying information so that it's all live and people can grasp that and then move beyond name calling such as conspiracy theorists, etc. and get into the reality of fact checking what these people actually say and do. That sounds like a great idea because you know this idea of terrorism that we defined at the beginning of this episode when you juxtapose it to this coercive state of spying and removing everyone's privacy and, and dissolving our rights and dissolving nationality, that is terrorism. I did have one thing I wanted to, uh, to add that might be of value. You can decide uh, for, for the section after uh, the Arnold Toynbee quote. Um, when Arnold Toynbee is talking about the universal church, I would point people to the ecumenical movement. There is a book called The Universal Church in the World of Nations, which is written by uh, Marquis of Lothian, Philip Kerr, uh, Sir Alfred Zimmern, and John Foster Dulles, among other people. So this shows the international ecumenical and continuity amongst the uh, people from the United States and Great Britain in trying to bring about a universal church or a world of nations. And this, this all took place out of the Oldham conferences and the moot uh, that Dorothy Sayers took part in in 1937. Well, I'm, I'm going to see your quote, and I'm going to one-up you, just because it makes a great, great ending for the show. Fabian socialist fiction writer, question mark, H.G. Wells, also a member uh, or friend of the Rhodes Roundtable. He sat in on our meetings. He was a privy to their world agenda. He has this famous quote from this book called uh, The New World Order in 1939, in which he talks about the New World Order, and he describes it as a, quote, New World Religion. And religion is just a veil that they're putting between themselves and the public. It has to do with a cybernetic net of collecting information, using artificial intelligence to chew on all that data they've collected on you for the past 10 years, to create a profile where you're predictable until they can market to you, so they can keep you distracted, keep you watching some box or some screen that's not informing you with life-giving information, information you can use to survive and be, I mean, you know, thrive in the world and be happy. That's, a, that's another point, but survival comes first. And I think our survival is, uh, it's, it's up for question right now. Can enough people wake up to realize that an immense amount of our resources are being stolen? And the other part that's not being stolen is being redirected toward enemies we don't have when we should really recognize uh, the origins and, 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 and elements and purpose and form and function of these intelligence communities that everyone just thinks are so cool and make another TV show about them and it's cool to just do that. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know what, Rich, just to uh, throw in real quick regarding New World Order and religion, you know, this is uh, definitely, in my opinion, the New Age or Archaic Revival, how it's been sold, which, been, which has been tied into the psychedelic movement, etc., that we exposed recently in my article, Manufacturing the Deadhead, a product, a product of Social Engineering. And I think these are all uh, definitely related. And when you get people to accept non-critical thinking as a religion, you know, it's, it's pretty much over from there. So this is why it's so important to get people to wake up, start critically, uh, thinking critically, learn how to research, learn how to filter the fallacies and the nonsense from their own minds. And that's a great way to leave it. They got robots making robots, they're making drones, they're going to stop making manned airplanes and manned flights, an obsolete thing that only happened for 100 years in human history. And they have a great Skynet and Cybernet waiting for you, unless you choose to learn some history, think for yourself, and learn how to communicate with other people. Jan and Kevin, thank you for joining us tonight. I really want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule and enlightening the audience with your experience with history. Thanks for having me on, Rich.
Yeah, thank you very much. And with all that being said, if you found the content of this episode to be of interest, then you'll likewise enjoy screening State of Mind, The Psychology of Control, which will help you understand some of the broader concepts we discussed tonight. Last but not least, if you'd like to know more, you can subscribe to our podcast, The Peace Revolution, which is available at tragedyandhope.com, where an hour a day keeps ignorance at bay. Tragedy and Hope, tools for thinking, clearly. Until next time, thank you for tuning in and not dropping out.